Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, so like I said, we're going to talk about Michael Kolesky, a... Uh, Economist that wrote around the same time as John Maynard Keynes, although unfortunately for him, wrote in Polish. Who can read Polish? Uh, and he came up to some, with some very similar conclusions, but approaching the question of uh, unemployment from a different direction, which is what makes this so interesting. A, a lot of post-Keynesian economists really like Kolesky, and uh, here I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Uh, that is that sometimes professors assign things in class because they want to learn about it. Well, that's why I did this. The reason I, I decided to do Kolesky in Intermediate Macro was I wish I knew Kolesky better. Um, I have a lot of colleagues that I admire that are Koleskians, and I thought I wanted to find out about it myself. So I looked and looked for a relatively simple way to introduce this to the class and eventually settled on an article that turned out to achieve several goals at once. It worked out really well, uh, j just a sheer chance. But this paper here by Pavlina Cherneva, which you can click on that link, of course, and go, go read. She is, and, and this is what's interesting about this, right? So, so it gives you some insight into how economists do things as well. She was building this model back in, well, you can see here, this was published 2012. So she was no doubt working on it before that. And uh, she was working on this to try to get a sense of how the deficit spending uh, after the financial crisis, the, um, ooh, let me slide down and show you this real quick. Uh, there's a study question later on it, but let me skip down to it to show you. There it is. Yes. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, okay? So this was the big fiscal stimulus that took place after the financial crisis. And so her question was, okay, but how much is this really helping the people that directly need the help? And so in order to answer that question, even though she's a post-Keynesian type person, she did not go to Keynes. She instead went to Kolesky. And let me tell you why. Kolesky, having uh, grown up in Poland, uh, knew Marx fairly well. And he approached things from a Marxist perspective, not in the sense that those of you who have also taken containing perspectives, that he believed in the uh, you know, collapse of capitalism and so forth, but that the way he tried to understand the economic system was not by types of spending. All right, Now, Keynes is doing types of spending. There's investment spending, there's consumption, there's government spending. So we're categorizing, uh, breaking the economy up into different kinds of spending. I'm opening the door right now because the dog desperately wants me to play with him. He has a new, uh, well, I say new. Come here, dog. Come here, couple. No, now he wants to fight. Um, he has this new bunny rabbit that he destroyed fairly quickly. You're probably about to see him rip it out of my hands. There he goes. All right. Um, anyway, I opened the door to hopefully distract him. So, Kolesky doesn't focus on kinds of spending. He focuses on groups of people. Uh, workers, capitalists, and the government, all right? So you can see where somebody trained from a Marxist perspective would think more along the lines of different classes of people. Uh, so if you're somebody trying to figure out the impact of deficit spending, uh, who is it actually affecting, you want to break it into classes of people. You know what kind of spending it is. It's deficit spending. You know, you know that, that it's a, a big jump in G, government spending, but you want to know what the distributional impact is. Who did it affect? So she's developing this model here that is based on Kolesky, and her whole reason for this paper is just so that she can move on later, I mean, let me put the uh, mute on there, uh, just so she can move on later to look at the data, all right? So she wants a model first before she can then get the data and plug the, the, the data into the model. And that's, that's the kind of thing we do, all right? So it's kind of interesting that uh, she followed this route. And let me show you, by the way, um, since she's uh, written this, and not just based on this, but here's her home page. There is, on the floor of the Senate, one of her uh, sets of data that she later calculated, you know, based on how the income distribution, or how the uh, deficit spending was affecting different people. Uh, that's from one of her papers. And she was just on TV here a very short time ago on Bloomberg, uh, 315 2020 talking about the post-COVID-19 pandemic economic stimulus because she uh, has developed an expertise in this. So uh, she also has the unique, I guess, uh, distinction of having been referred to as a man on television uh, because they had no idea she wasn't on the show and it was just Pavlina Cherneva and he showed this and he showed that. And it's like, yeah, he didn't do anything. She did. All right. 
So she is going to, uh, uh, you know, build this Koleskian model. Uh, 92 is easy. I'll let you figure out 92 for yourself. Uh, she's going to do this Koleskian model so that she can figure out distributional impacts. All right. Now, I was not used to this. You know, as I said, I assigned this so I could figure it out myself. And I was not used to thinking along these lines. And it took me a while to figure it out. And once I did, uh, you really get some insights that you wouldn't have otherwise. Sorry, I'm having to play with the dog again. You really get some insights you wouldn't have otherwise. Now, I'm going to have to do this on the board over here, which is going to be especially difficult with him wanting to be played with right now. But we'll see how this works out. So let me move over here to the marker board. Check out the monitor. I'm going to have to zoom back a little bit. And I, before I do that, so what's the first study question that's about the math here, right? The first study question is, show how starting with uh, P sub C, W sub Z, that, that equation, uh, how consumers spend what they get and investors get what they spend. Six equations, some notes. All right, so this is all uh, manipulating some equations. And so let me go right over here. And I will show you how to do this. Okay. All right. The question gives you this equation, all right? It gives you P sub C, Q sub C is equal to W sub C, N sub C plus W sub I, N sub I. Let me check the monitor and make sure all that showed up. Yes, it did. Uh, now, here's what those variables mean, okay? Uh, and she's breaking things down differently from the way we have broken them down so far, again, because she's following Koleski here. These subscripts refer to specific sectors of the economy. Sorry, kind of hard to write this way. Uh, of course, as you know, from having been in the class, I don't write that well even when I don't have this uh, problem right here. Let me turn this light off and see if that cuts back a little bit of the glare. It does. However, I may need to turn on another light. Uh, anyway, let's see. Well, maybe I could just move this one. Yeah, I think that helped. All right. Um, so, consumption. So that is the price level in the consumption goods sector. That's the average price of all consumer goods. It's, it's what we would call the consumer price index, right? It, it's uh, analogous to that. This is, okay, I, I should do a, a separate thing here. This, of course, is P equals price. And Q, guess what, economic students? Q equals quantity. So this is the average price of consumer goods. This is the total quantity of consumer goods. So yes, yes. Uh, price times quantity is going to give you the total revenue that was earned by firms that sell consumption goods, right? So the firms that sell consumption goods sold this many at this average price. So you multiply the two together, that's how much income that they earned. So that's how much income that the consumption goods sector earned. It's also how much... Um, the dollar value of all the spending on consumption goods, because obviously it's the same thing. How much people spent on consumption goods is also how much they earned in that sector. Now, the W, you'll not be surprised to hear, is for wages. The average wage rate. And I is investment. Subscript I is investment. I'm going to have a look over here at the monitor a little closer to make sure. Uh, I may shift the, the, the camera's focus just a tad here since I wrote so high up on the screen. There, all right. So, uh, once again, the uh, subscripts, uh, well, I'm sorry, let, let me go back to the W and the N. This is the average wage rate. Oh, I forgot the N. Let's see, what color have I not used? I haven't used blue. All right. Oops. Blue. Uh, let's see. N is, as, as you already know, because we've already done this. We've already used N for employment. Okay. So, WCNC is the average wage rate in the consumption goods sector, or the average wage rate earned by workers in the consumption goods sector. Picture Walmart, all right? 
the average wage that they earn, multiplied by the number of people that are working in that sector, the number of employees at Walmart. So the average wage at Walmart multiplied by the number of workers at Walmart. And so you multiply those two together, and economists call that W times N. They call it the wage bill. Now, why am I so concerned that I get a, a yet another different color? I don't know why I am, uh, and I think I'm out of colors. So, W, oops, let's see. W times N equals wage bill. It's a, a handy way to reference it that the wage bill is the total bill that Walmart had to pay out in wages. All right, so W times N is the wage bill. It's the total amount that they paid out. So the wage bill in the consumption goods sector is right here, W times N. And the wage bill in the investment goods sector is here. All right, uh, so these are the people that work at like the construction company that's outside the window of our classroom that we may never see again, um, where they're building the performance hall that we may never be able to use. Uh, and so uh, these are construction workers, let's say. That's the average wage of a construction worker and the average number of people working in the construction goods uh, industry. So that's the wage bill in construction goods, the wage bill in the investment goods sector, right? Wage bill in the consumption goods sector, wage bill in the investment goods sector. Now, now let's look at the equation. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, let me say, let me say this too. Uh, I want to make this clear too. Um, no, 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 that's okay. Yeah, that, that's good. All right. So uh, now let's look at the whole equation. And I think if you don't mind, I'm going to, nah, I'll leave it like it is for now. I, I want to erase all this other junk here, but I'll leave it like it is for now. So uh, what Koleski is saying with this opening equation is that he is making a simplifying assumption. He's saying, what if all the Walmart workers tend to spend all their money? And what if all the investment, what if all the construction workers tend to spend all their money? then the total income in the consumption goods sector, the total dollar value of, of all the stuff that Walmart sold, is equal to the wages of their own employees plus the wages of the employees of that construction company outside the window of our classroom. Let me say that again. He's going to make the simplifying assumption, and I'm, and I'm going to uh, uh, follow up on this here in just a second. He's going to make the simplifying assumption. Let's just say that workers tend to make uh, income uh, it, low enough to where they just basically spend it all. They don't really have a lot of savings, all right? So uh, they have some savings in real life. But let's, uh, for simplicity, rather than have to multiply this by 0.9 and this by 0.85 or something like that, let's just say they spend it all. Let's just say the consumption goods sector, that employees at Walmart really don't have enough money left over to save. They spend everything. And what do workers spend money on? Consumption goods, all right? That's the only thing they have to spend money on is consumption goods. Uh, and what do construction workers, how much do they save? Oh, very little. Let's just say zero. All right? So when Walmart is adding up its total sales at the end of the year, the money that they received in their registers came from the consumption goods sector workers going into the store and buying stuff and the construction workers going into their stores and buying stuff. Now, let me back up here to a previous study question to uh, show you how far off Koleski is. Because Koleski, like I say here, is making a simplifying assumption. Let's say that people, that, that workers spend all of their money. We've actually covered this, and, and I didn't tell you this at the time, but the specific reason for including this was to come back to it now. I wanted to show you this later. Now, we don't collect data in the real world on um, the income of workers versus the income of capitalists. This is going to be the workers. Right? These are the, uh, the, we're not going to have a government sector, just as always. We're not going to have a foreign sector. It's just consumption goods and investment goods. So these are all of our workers. We're going to assume that the workers spend everything. We don't really collect data in the real world, because Keynes had a big impact on how we collect data, uh, on uh, classes of people. But we do have what I showed you way back before exam one, this breakdown here of how much income, or, or how much people spend at each quintile, all right? Now let's make the assumption that capitalists tend to be in the top 20%, right up there uh, at the you know, gross income average of 188,000 uh, in mean expenditures of 100 and, you know, basically 117. So they're spending 62% of their income. Then the workers, let's say for simplicity, are the bottom 80%. If you, let me look back at my notes here. Uh, yeah, that actually, if you calculate the average of 78, 96, if you, if you plug those numbers in, it's right about 
In other words, that if it is true that the bottom 80% of income earners tend to, be cap uh, tend to be workers, rather, then this isn't far off, all right? This isn't far off. If it is true that the bottom 80% of income earners tend to be workers and not capitalists, then this is pretty close to true, all right? That, that basically the consumption goods sector workers spend all their money and the investment goods sector workers spend all their money. If it's not exactly true, we probably need to multiply this by like a 0.95 and a 0.95 or something like that, but it's not far off and it's a good uh, initial approximation. Okay, so once again, what we're saying here is, if workers spend all their money, then the total income of the consumption goods sector must be equal to the wage bill in consumption goods and the wage bill in investment goods. At the end of the year, when consumption goods firms count their receipts. Those receipts came from workers in their own sector spending all their money back at the store and workers in this only other sector we have, investment goods, spending all their income at the store. Now, going back to the study question itself, it says, um, show how consumers spend what they get. You don't actually show how. Uh, Koleski is just assuming that consumers spend what they get. These are consumers. I mean, they work in the consumption goods, and they work in the investment goods, but they're consumers. They spend everything. Well, actually, we don't actually show that. We simply assume it, all right? So uh, I'll show you the, the, the complete study question answer here in a minute, but that's the first part of the puzzle. It asked you to prove two things in the study question. One was that consumers spend what they get. Well, we just did that, and, and actually it was actually by assumption. Now, it's gonna take us five more equations to get to this following thing. Investors get what they spend, or capitalists get what they spend, all right? And let me show you how you do this. All right, let's put that first equation again. Wow, there's some sort of B in here. Now, there's a lot of bugs uh, coming out because it's warm right now, and I have the door open so that the dog, if he wants to, can leave. And it's unfortunately letting a lot of wildlife in. But anyway, uh, yeah, there's a, some sort of big mosquito-looking thing right there. So, all right. Uh, and then look, I don't know, oh, he flew away. I was going to show you. All right, so let's start here with the PC... QC equals, and again, the study question itself gives you this equation. You don't have to remember this. Well, hell, you don't have to remember anything right now because we are uh, having to do exams to where you're allowed to use your study questions. But anyway, in another semester, this would not be something you had to remember because it's in the equation. Okay, so the next goal here uh, with these equations is to figure out... Um, how it is that, you know, uh, Koleski claims that, and, and this goes back to this, I should, I should jump ahead to tell you this. Remember back when I was telling you about the business cycle, and I said at the top, there tends to be a fall in investment, all right? And there also tends to be a fall in profits. There also tends to be a fall in profits. Now, we explained that way back then, when I first did it, let me make this a little thicker, explained that way back then when we first did it as, you know, well, Firms are cutting back on investment, so therefore firms' sales fall, and therefore their profits fall. But there's actually more to it than that. Koleski is saying there's an extremely high correlation between investment and profits, and then in fact, the investment spending money tends to create the profits, all right? So that's what we're gonna be getting to here eventually. So we wanna figure out profits. So uh, let's say this, this next equation is gonna be, and we're gonna do it this way. Um, you're given this equation, then the uh, next equation is going to be, okay, well, what are profits in the consumption goods sector? Profits in the consumption goods sector are going to be equal to total sales and then just minus the wage bill, right, John? Yeah. Minus the wage bill. This is one of those things I told you I had to sit and think about it for a while. I had not considered it this way before. I had a tough time with this equation until I, I had a mental breakthrough. And that was this. All right, so what we've got here is profits in the consumption goods sector must be their total sales minus their total costs. And then you get your profit. Total sales minus total costs. And, and what confused me initially, and I was thinking too micro, 
And remember I said at the very beginning of the semester, uh, one of the very early study questions, you've got to be careful about the fallacy of composition, about thinking about macro as if it were micro. You can come to some very illogical conclusions. You, thinking like a macro economist requires a, 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 here's an overused term, a paradigm shift to where you, you, you start thinking in terms of the whole system and not individual units. Here's the deal. I'm sitting there thinking as I, when I read this the first time, wait a minute, profits are going to be equal to total sales minus something, sure. But it's going to be like the, the labor costs and then like the capital costs and the rent and stuff like this. No, no, you idiot John Harvey. All right? At a macro level, there is only one cost, and it's labor. There is either, uh, uh, think about this, okay, we just ordered um, for dinner tonight uh, food from, there you go dog, go chase that, whoops, I didn't get it outside, um, the uh, uh, Blue Mesa, all right? So I had something, I don't even remember what I had. Uh, let's say it was fajitas, it wasn't, but I uh, had fajitas. Now, when Blue Mesa made those uh, fajitas, First of all, they had to pay the chef and then pay the people that put it in a, you know, a, a box and then the person that drove it over here. And they also had to pay for the chicken, right? So like, yeah, so it's not just labor. They also had to pay for the chicken. But wait a minute, they didn't pay a chicken though, all right? In fact, that would have been a really, really sad thing. Here, here's, here's five bucks we're about to kill you. Um, that, in fact, they uh, don't pay the chicken, they pay the farmer or you know, whatever the massive conglomerate is that grows chickens. Uh, so nowhere at any level does anyone actually pay coal, pay metal, pay gasoline. They pay people, all right? Everything that you spend either ends up in profit or in wages, one way or the other. Now we can you know, uh, expand the definition there somewhat, but it's going to remember that total GDP is not just total sales, it's also total income. Aha! So what's total income? Well, it's either going to the capitalists or it's going to the workers. It's either coming out as wages or as profits. So in other words, when you drill down and you keep saying, let, let, let's go back to the fajita example. Okay, they had to pay the chef and they had to pay the person who drove it over here and they had to pay the uh, workers who put it in a box. Ah, but then they had to pay for the chicken and that's not here. Well, yeah, it is. It's still there because of the fact that they don't pay a chicken, all right? They don't pay a chicken, they pay the people who made the poor chicken, all right? And then told it that, uh, don't worry about anything. Um, it's just a, a, a change of scenery for you, is what they told it right before the bad thing happened. Uh, so, ultimately, the only cost at a macro level is labor costs, right? That's it. Think about that. When you drill down, again, nobody pays plastic, Nobody pays, uh, uh, you know, when they made this pen here, nobody gave plastic some money. Here, go have a good time. Uh, and instead, they just paid workers and they paid capitalists. And that's it. That's where the income ends up. So, for the entire consumption goods sector, not for one firm, but for the entire consumption goods sector, for the, the sector that just sells consumption goods to you and me, their profits are equal to their total sales minus the total wage bill in that sector. That's their profits. But wait, check it out. Look at this equation. All right, now look at this equation and compare it to the previous one. And see if you notice something. See if you notice, and this is another one that took me a while to figure out, all right? See if you notice what that's equal to. PCQC minus WCNC is equal to this. PCQC minus WCNC must be equal to WINI. And again, as I just said, this one's the one that, that took me a while to figure out. And I was like, oh my God, of course, this makes so much sense now. The consumption goods sector cannot possibly earn a profit from only selling to its own workers. All they're doing is getting back their own money. They're only getting back the money that they paid out to these individuals. And so they break even. There's no profit. The only way for the consumption goods sector to profit is through the investment goods sector. Their workers coming in. The construction workers coming in. The consumption goods sector did not pay these wages. So when they get these wages, this is above and beyond what they already paid out. So the source of, of profit in the consumption goods sector is the wages times employment or the wage bill in the investment goods sector. 
I never thought about that. See, that's the thing. You know, we, we, we've got these economists who largely agree with each other, but hey, let's take a look at it from a different perspective and think about it in a different way. And so this really taught me something going through this article. All right. Now, I, and I'll redraw this whole thing here in a minute um, so that you can see the whole study question answer. All right, so we're done with consumption. We wanted to know, remember, the question says, uh, show that consumers spend what they get. That was the first line. Here's what the consumer, here are the consumers. And these are consumers, even though they're in the investment goods sector, they're still, that was just where they got their wages. That's not where they spent their money. So uh, these consumers spent all their money by assumption, essentially by assumption, which is not a, a, not, not a terrible assumption uh, if we can trust income distribution statistics. Now, down here, but, but then the second thing we have to prove in this question is, and the really big thing, is that investors get what they spend. All right, so, uh, so we know, well, what do investors get? They get profits, right? So the, so the next line is, okay, we know, we, we've proven the first thing. What are the profits in the consumption goods sector? And guess what? What are we going to do next? We're going to do profits in the investment goods sector. That's what we're after next. So investment... which of course would be P-I-Q-I, uh, but I wrote it as I because, and I think she does in the article too, as I recall, um, but I'm writing it here as I because that's how we've done it so far in this class, so we've always used I for investment. Um, and uh, in her terminology though, if we were to be consistent with this P-C-Q-C, we would just write it like that. But we're not gonna end up caring much about the uh, price level. Ah, sorry, I'm fighting with the dog. Ha, I got the toy. He also keeps walking over top of my microphone cord. Um, this is much better than a wireless mic, but it's also dragging all over the floor. Uh, so, what is total investment spending equal to? Which equation do I have first here? That one. He is right now laying his toy on my leg to induce me to try to steal it from him, but I will not. Okay, yes, I will. Got it. Oops, bounced it off the door. Uh, okay. Total investment spending has to be paid out. Remember that, that it's spending and revenue, uh, you know, the, the total spending for investment goods is right here. That's how much money people spend on building new performance halls and so forth, all right? Well, when they distribute this money as income, some of it ends up as income for the workers and some as income for the owners of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, companies. So total income is either income for the workers or income for the capitalists. That's all this says here. Total income or total expenditure, but again, again at a macro level, income and expenditure are going to be the same thing. Where did they get the income? Because somebody made an expenditure for these investment goods. Where did the construction company building the... Uh, performance hall outside our classroom, where are they getting the money? Because we're spending it, all right? So this is our spending, but their income. What do they do with their income? Well, some of it goes to their workers. Uh, and remember, this is the entire macro economy. So uh, this is at a macro level. So the only cost at a macro level is a labor cost. That company does not pay the crane, all right? Here, here's 100 bucks for the crane to go lift something. No, no, they pay the people who made the crane. They pay people. It's always people who are receiving income. So the only cost at a macro level is a labor cost. So uh, the, when they uh, receive this income and they pay it out, they don't pay any of it out to tractors or to uh, bricks or anything like that. They pay it out to workers and the rest they keep as profit, all right? Again, you gotta think macro. I keep using micro examples because they're easier to imagine, but you gotta think macro here. That either the income is paid out to workers, which is a cost, or it's kept as profit. Those are the only two things that can possibly happen. Okay, next equation. We're almost done. Pardon me, dog. Well, we wanna know profit, right? I mean, the, the, the whole goal of this part of the answer is to figure out how much money capitalists make, all right? Uh, and so we need to know the same equation but for the investment goods sector. Man, I love this stuff. Voila, as they say in France. There is our profit equation for the investment goods sector. Profits in the investment goods sector are equal to total revenue in the investment goods sector 
minus total costs in the investment goods sector. And remember, ultimately, you're only paying workers, right? You never pay a tractor or a brick. So they're very similar to this equation up here. Look, total profit in the consumption goods sector is the total revenue they earned minus their total costs, which is only labor costs. Same thing here, exact same thing here. Total profits in the investment goods sector equal to uh, their total revenue minus their total costs. Okay, now check this next part out. Let's see, let me turn on the fan in here because it's getting a little warm. Um, check this next part out. What we want to do now is add those two profits together uh, to, in order to find out what total profits are equal to. And you're going to find something very interesting here. Let's see. So interesting that I'll write it in red. I hope that this is still... Yeah, I can't write much lower than this though, can I? Okay. Pi C plus Pi I all right, so profits in the consumption goods sector plus profits in the investment goods sector are, of course, uh, I mean, I'm going to write, that's just total profits. I'm going to do a profit without a subscript, but that's just total profits, the entire macro economy. Now, glance up here and look. Check this out. What are profits in the, yeah, what are profits in the consumption goods sector? Well, there they are. Okay, so let's write that down. That'll be our first equal to W-I-N-I. -I. All right, so we've got consumption goods sector profits plus investment goods sector profits. What are consumption goods sector profits? We worked that out in the second equation. That was W-I-N-I, -I, all right? Plus, and what were profits in the investment goods sector? And, gosh, I guess I'm going to use I again. Okay, um, this second equation here, I'm sorry, this fourth equation here shows that profits in the investment goods sector is equal to total revenue in that sector, which is also just I, as it says in the previous equation, because up to now we've used I. You can do it either way uh, on your study question answers. It doesn't really matter, but because here's what's going to happen. Look what, see how far down we are. Okay, I'm going to move it just a bit because I, I don't want to lose this last thing here. There is some sort of bug right on the lens. There it goes. Uh, okay. Look at that last part of the expression here. W-I-N-I plus I minus W-I-N-I. Well, heck, it turns out that profits, there's that bug again, profits are simply equal to investment. Profits end up being equal to investment. However much firms invest that generates that much profit. All right? and now, not for each firm. Because you're thinking, well, shoot, then I'll invest as much as I want. Well, this doesn't work on a micro level. On a micro level, you could get royally screwed by, by investing in something that's not very popular. This is a macro issue. The higher investment spending is in the macro economy, the more profit it generates. And the, the, the reason is not that complicated. Go back up here to the first equation. So let's say that when TCU invested, when they built that new performance hall, they